We're so glad you've joined us. Um, this is February, the end of February, and it's been two years. Most of you probably think back about two years ago when you first heard about this thing called COVID-19, a novel virus, and, and maybe you were like me, a little incredulous that, oh yeah, this is going to take over the world, and it's clear over in China, it's a long ways away, and... Uh, this has been a painful and difficult process of learning for all of us. As I look back over the two years, I think of how many difficulties there have been that we have waded through. There have been loss of life from people that I know. There have been a lot of other losses. Um, sadly enough, there's been a lot of division and arguing about every stage of this journey. There's been a loss of people who've left our church. There's been a loss of people who, who don't really talk to me anymore. There, there are a ways in which this pandemic has intensified all of the other losses. Uh, people who've lost loved ones for other reasons. Everything just seems heavier and stronger. And so we're talking about a time of, of pain and loss and what does God have to say to us in the middle of all of this? What are, what are we supposed to be learning about him and about ourselves? And so we're going to go to a beautiful book called the Book of Ruth in the Old Testament. And it's probably not on most people's top 10 list, but it is a powerful picture of the beauty of God's grace and sovereignty and work in the middle of the mess. In the middle, it's like a beautiful diamond in the middle of a bunch of mud. And I want us to walk through this story. And the first part we're talking with is let's look at the chapter one, which really underscores that loss is a part of life. And the, the truth is, is the beauty and the light of God's goodness really stands out in the middle of difficulty and pain and loss. And so I want us to walk through the first part of the book of Ruth and kind of get a picture of what was going on then. <clears throat> Excuse me, and I'll try to give you a little backstory if you're not familiar with it. But particularly, I want you to see how painful it must have been for kind of the central figure in this chapter, who is a woman named Naomi. Let's read this together. It, <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. <laughs> That's a cheery way to start the book, isn't it? Uh, it's setting it, first of all, in the context of the judges. And if you're familiar at all with the Old Testament chronology, there was a period of Moses leading and bringing the people out of Egypt and handing off to Joshua, and then they conquered and settled the land that we call Israel. And, and then there was a cycle that was actually a spiral. It was a downward cycle as there were 12 different judges over a period from about 1350. Uh, B.C. to 1100 B.C., so about 250 years, and it was this constant cycle of the Israelites would move into idolatry and immorality and forget God and get into a, an ugly place, and then God would allow a neighboring country to come in and conquer them and, and make them slaves and steal their food, and then they would cry out like many of us when things get bad, God, I'm sorry, please help me. And then God would raise up a judge, and that judge would be the, the ruler, the, often a military leader, and they would kick out the in, enemy, the conquerors, and then there would be a time of, of peace and blessing, and then there would be a slow slide. And so you really have this spiral of the leaders who are not doing the job they're supposed to. And then when they die, there's no plan to replace them. And they just seem to go into, uh, into this state. In fact, the last verse of the book of Judges said there's no king in Israel and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. <laughs> Can you imagine? That's, that's kind of the definition of anarchy. Everybody just does whatever they want to do and it, it ended up in a terrible spiral. So that's the setting. And then it goes on and it says, and there was a famine in the land. <clears throat> now, a famine is a severe thing here. We've, we've dealt with a drought for the last, you know, number of five years or so. And uh, finally, there seems to have been some relief this last winter. But, but a famine 
makes you realize how fragile their supply chain was. We talk about supply chains being messed up and not being able to get the, if you remember the beginning, we couldn't get toilet paper. Um, some foods you can't get. Every, every building material seems to be slowed down. Every, everything seems to be operating with this, well, you know, COVID. And so it was a situation like that, only in their situation, it was their food. If the rain doesn't come, if the locusts come in and eat the crop, they got nothing to eat. They're, they're living year to year. They don't have a huge amount of storage and, and built up wealth. They've, they're looking at starvation. And so in that context, the nations were being destroyed. They were being overrun by neighbors. The judges were becoming more and more corrupt. The spiral kind of like the, the last judge is Samson, before Samuel at least. And, uh, and Samson is a mess. You don't, wouldn't even want him as a neighbor, let alone the, the ruler. And so in that setting, it says, this is our story. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. She's kind of the central figure here. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem. Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. And I want to pause for just a minute and catch, I want you to catch this. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem. Now, I don't know if you remember when we get around Christmas time, we talk about Micah 5 2, which is a prophecy that says the, the line of Jesus is going to come from Bethlehem, Ephrathah. And that's because there's two Bethlehems in Jesus' day. And it's specifically saying these are. They were from the city of Bethlehem. That should be familiar to us. And they were Ephrathites. That was their small family clan. And they moved and left and went to Moab. So I want you just to rehearse with me this process in Naomi's life. What would it have been like for her? She is going through an incredible series of losses. And losses can become cumulative. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it's easy for us to begin to tell our story with, and then this happened, and then this happened. and then, Now, maybe there were some good things or some, some awesome things that happened in the middle, but, but we kind of push those aside, and it's easy to rehearse the cumulative impact of all the grief and losses and difficulties. And, and I've heard people doing that. They're, they're like, and then here's what happens in our nation, and then here's what happened with my family, and then here's what happened with the hospital, and then here's... And it's a litany that they are already rehearsing in their mind. And that's kind of what this story is about. So she's gone through a loss spiral, and it started with a loss of her home. There was a, a famine, so she left their nation. They, they left the nation of Israel, and maybe your geography is not too good of the Near East, but Jerusalem was here, and in this time there were there were Jerusalem right here, and Bethlehem is about seven miles south of Jerusalem. And they traveled over across the Jordan River and down to the king of Moab. Now, the Moabites were actually kind of related. Um, Abraham had a nephew named Lot. And Lot had two daughters and then two grandsons through some kind of ugly stories, if you want to read it. But the two grandsons were named Moab and Ben-Ami. And they were the beginning of the nation of Moab and the beginning of the nation of Ammon, or Ammon, as we would call it today. And so they're moving from the country that God has given to them, and they're moving to a neighboring country. And it's a country where they have to, first of all, leave their relatives, they leave their village, they leave God's promised land, and they go to a country where Yahweh, to the, the God of Israel, is not worshipped. In fact, the worship is of the God Chemosh. And Chemosh was associated also with Asherah, and he was a, a cruel God. In fact, there are some indications that, that part of the worship to Chemosh was the offering of your children and allowing them to be killed as sacrifices before the God Chemosh. And the the celebrations around Asherah were often sexual orgies and things that, that God 
clearly frowned on, but that was also what Moab used. If you can go back in the Old Testament and remember the story of Balaam, who, who was trying to curse the Israelites as they were coming in to the land of Israel. And so she was leaving her home and she was going to a nation that had idol worship and foreign gods. And she was leaving all of that. She was losing her home. And then she goes through another series of incredible, painful losses. And I'm going to just read it for you out of the text here. It says, And after they had lived there about ten years, verse 4, both Malon and Kilion also died. Excuse me. Verse 3 says, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and then her two sons died. So can you get this? She goes through a famine in a messed up country. She moves to a foreign nation. She loses her husband. And then her two sons get married to Moabite women. And you may not think of that as a bad thing, but I'm, I'm sure it grieved her heart a little bit that, that they were marrying the local women who may have not even known about God. They would have been raised, at least, as idol worshipers. And so she sees her sons marrying Moabite women, and then both of her sons die. And so the story in this 10 years is that Naomi goes over there with her husband and her two sons and there's hope to stay there for a little while and come home. And in that process, she loses her family. She loses all of her relatives that she came with and then she has two daughter-in-laws. And so she decides to head home and she is angry and bitter and upset. And she says, I'm going to go back to where I came from. And so she says to Orpah and to Ruth, her two daughter-in-laws, she said, you stay here. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to have more children and you can wait and marry them. I mean, there's no hope for anything from me. Why don't you just stay here? And after much pleading, Orpah decides to stay in Moab. And Ruth says, no, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to go with you. I will not leave you. And so Naomi comes back to Bethlehem and it says when she gets to Bethlehem, there's a big stir. I mean, she hasn't been there for 10 years. Everybody's wanting to see how she's doing, what's going on. And she gives this little speech that I'm guessing she rehearsed all the way home. What am I going to say when all the relatives come, when they welcome me and they say, how did it go in Moab? When they say, where's Elimelech? When they say, where's your sons? And I have to tell them all that happened. What, what am I going to say? And so she comes back in and here's her little speech. Verse 20, she says, Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because my, the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Man, can you hear the pain in that? She says, Don't call me Naomi. And the word Naomi means pleasant one or beautiful. It reflects on the, the blessing of her parents and the blessing of God. She says, don't call me Naomi. That's not who I am anymore. Call me Mara, which means literally bitter. And then she says, call me Mara because God, the Almighty, doesn't that sound like a distant way to refer to God? You know, the Almighty has made my life bitter. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. And then she goes on and she says, why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. What do you think her perception of the world is? What do you think her perception of God is? You see, I think we have a, terribly, a terrible tendency to look at the circumstances and the feelings and the the things that have happened in our life and interpret God and interpret the future and interpret our, our view of things comes out of that, the bitterness of our experience sometimes. And you look at what it is that happened to her, is that in her grieving, she got stuck in bitterness. And she goes through this spiral of bitterness. Now, loss is painful. When you lose a loved one, I, some of you have listened to me for a while, you know that, that my brother Kendall died when, he was, when I was 23, he was 19. 
And I think that was a, a puncturing in our family sense that I, I never said it out loud, but I thought stuff like that didn't happen to us. You know, I didn't feel like we were bulletproof. I just felt like things were good with us. We were, we were that good family. And then you realize, oh no, things can happen. Lots of things can happen. And you can begin to focus on those. And, and there is a natural process to grief. I always talk to people about grief having waves. And when, when you're first going through a loss, there's huge and high waves and they come fast. And there's not much you can do about it. But over time, as you heal and as you go through the process, they get smaller and further apart. And there's a natural process that people have kind of laid out for us, that there's the time of denial. That, that really can't be true. I can't believe they're not here and I keep expecting them to walk around the corner. And then there's the anger that sets in. Sometimes it's focused at a person. Sometimes it's focused at God. And then there's a, often a stage of bargaining of saying, what if this had happened? Or what if I hadn't done that? Or, or what, what could be different? And then often there's just a depression, a sadness, a lowness. And then finally, as you come out of that, there's a, a coming to acceptance and resolution. And, and that's a general process for everybody. But grieving is so individual. And there have been so many kinds of grieving. Um, certainly loss of a loved one is something that we all have seen and we all, perhaps many of us have related to. But there's lots of other losses, especially these last two years. There's been loss of job. There's been the loss of respect. There's been the loss of security in so many ways. There, there's been the loss of maybe even optimism. And so in those losses, it's easy for us to begin to put together a story. There's accumulation of all the bad and difficult things that have not only happened to me, but somehow things that happened to other people. I start picking those up as well. And it just feels bitter. And so look what happened to Naomi. She said, don't call me Naomi. In the Hebrew, the, the idea of the meaning of a name is very significant. And she says, I don't even want you to call me that. Call me Mara. And I don't know if she meant that literally or if she was just really angry, but her way of seeing herself was through the lens of her losses. She now said, I am not only have is bitterness or anger a, a phase that I will pass through, it's, it's where I'm stuck. It's where I've stalled. It's who I am. And then she said, God, the Almighty has afflicted me. Her, her picture of God is that he's up there going, what else can I do to her? And, and I, I've dealt with a friend who, who had a number of bad things going on and he finally said to me, I think I'm doomed. I think God is out to get me. What a, what a terrible place to be where you think that the God of the universe just has it in for you and that you're viewing God through the lens of your experiences. And then she said, perhaps the saddest one, my future. I went out full and I came back empty. And she's talking like this is the end of the story. Like I had a husband, I had two sons, I had hopes for the future, I had, I had a plan. And now I got nothing. I am absolutely empty. And so she is caught in this perspective that's come out of the the infection of the bitterness. And I, and I like to think of it sometimes like a physical wound. Like if you get a cut on your arm, or even if they do some kind of a major internal surgery where they, they put you to sleep and cut things and take things out and work things around, you can recover from incredible wounds. But all it takes is one little infection. If you get some kind of infection, even, even in an exterior cut, if you get a bad infection in it, it can literally go septic and it can result sometimes in terrible things that happen. And if you have a surgery, you can be walking within hours sometimes, but if you get an infection, it can go septic and it can actually take your life. And I think that's a great picture of what happens to us when we get wounded. In every single one of our lives, there are some wounds. There are unkind things that people say. There are loss of jobs. 
And certainly there's loss of loved ones. There's loss of our, of our hopes of what could be and should be. And either we can take that to God and allow him to heal us and to, to, to wash the, the injuries that we've received so that they don't get infected. Or we can begin to focus on our, our feelings, our hurts, our accumulation of losses. And we begin to hold that up and we look at God through that lens and we look at ourselves through that lens and we look at the future through that lens. And it ends you up being caught in that spiral of bitterness. And so I want to ask you a question. Do you tend to view God through your experiences or do you interpret your experiences through God's view? I think this is one of the powerful things about Bible stories. Uh, I love the fact that the Bible doesn't whitewash things, that it paints things as they were and it paints individuals as they really were, that Rare is a, is a hero in the Bible that doesn't have some kind of failures. So it's so comforting for me to come and to say, man, I can see how Naomi did that. I can see how easy that is to do that. I can see how easy it is to become Mara and to let that dominate how I treat people, how I look at the future. And, and there are a lot of people through this time that have become cynical, that have become divided from their friends that have become angry. And there's a very tendency, a good tendency to be pessimistic about the future. And, and I want you to see in the book of Ruth that God, in the middle of all of that heaviness, that God has a plan. And I think it's like in a movie, you know, sometimes you can exactly tell what's going to happen in a movie because like, doom, 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 doom. It's like, oh man, don't go in there. Don't go in there. It's not going to go well. And, and you can tell by the music. And then sometimes in the midst of a, of a dark scene, the violins start playing and their flute kind of lifts. And there's, there's this little tendril of music, if you will, that, that kind of wins its way in and says, oh, this is where it starts to get better. And I think that's how we see the first chapter of Ruth. We're going to study it for the next couple of weeks. So I'm not going to steal the thunder of the next two chapters or the next three chapters. But I want you to see that in God's plan, the story isn't over. Isn't that a great thing to realize? In fact, every great movie, it would not be a great movie if there wasn't tragedy and difficulty and things to be overcome and problems. That's what makes a movie exciting. If you watched a movie where it was like paint drying on the wall, nothing ever happened. It was like, why would you watch that? But the essence of great stories is in the middle of our difficulty, God is at work. And the story is not over because God is still God and God is still at work. And so you see in the story of Ruth that she's returning home. And to her, it feels like a trudging back to a place where she can be, <laughs> she can be exposed. She can be mocked. She can be seen now for what has happened to her life. She's not made a success. She's not got anything to show for it. She's coming back home and, and basically she's complaining but she's returning home. She's come back to the country that God gave them. She's come back to where Jehovah is worshipped. She's come back to where Jerusalem is just seven miles away and, and the center of what God is doing and wants to do. The, the tabernacle of God is just north of her at Shiloh. And so God is still working and he's, she's coming back. And sometimes that's the first step is even if you don't feel like it, you decide to come back to church. You start to pick your Bible up and read it again, even if it doesn't seem like it's really making a difference. You, you start to come back. That's the first good step. And then there's a powerful little piece that I kind of skipped over. And that is when, when Naomi says to Ruth in leaving Moab, Ruth, you stay here. I don't have anything more for you. I don't have any sons that you can marry I got nothing for you. Just stay home. And I, I feel like the way she was bitter, she probably said it a little angrily, a little, a little trying to scare her off. And Ruth has this incredible thing. It's a statement of commitment and loyalty such that it's sometimes used in weddings. And Ruth says to her, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you because where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. 
You know, she was raised as a Moabite. She was raised with the worship of Chemosh and Asherah. But somewhere along the line, she had come to see, even in Naomi's embittered state, she had seen that there was a God of Israel. And she was throwing in her lot. And then she goes on to say, Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Do you hear that little, that little hint that she sees that there's life even after this life? She says, Naomi, there's nothing you can do that's going to drive me away. I'm, I'm with you. I'm going home with you. And your people are going to be my people. I'm going to become an Israelite. And your God will be my God. And it's particularly impacting because the Moabites had been cursed by God because they refused to help the Israelites when they were coming out of the desert. Such that in Deuteronomy, it says that no Moabite can even come into the temple, even to 10 generations. And so what God does in this beautiful story of Ruth is he picks an incredibly unlikely person from a, a cursed country. And he says, I'm going to do something through Ruth's life. I'm going to do something beautiful and amazing that shows the grace of God to those that don't deserve it to those that never had it coming, to those that weren't part of the people of God. He says, I want to show you some grace. And so in Ruth's commitment, you see this hint of God is at work. He's drawn Ruth's heart to himself. Ruth is refusing to leave Naomi. And then at the very end of the chapter, it says, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Bethlehem means house of bread. It was kind of a bread basket of that area. And when they left Bethlehem, they left that. And when they came back, it says the barley harvest was just starting. And as we'll see in the rest of the story, that barley harvest is the beginning of something great. So even the writer to, of the book of Ruth is saying, look here, God is changing the scene God is changing the story. And so I want to ask you that, that question again. Do you tend to view God through your own experiences? If things are going well for you, do you feel close to God and like God's good and he cares about you and loves you? And if, if things are all going south, you feel like God's angry or he's distant or he doesn't care? You see, we are up and down all over. Our emotions go up and down with every experience. And we have a great tendency to see our life, our own identity, to see God, to see the future, to see other people through the lens of, ah, oh, it's good or it's bad based on my little experience. Or do you interpret your experiences through God's view? You see, I think that's one of the powerful things of the book of the roof, of the book of Ruth, is he says, I want to show you what I can do. And even when it looks darkest, when it looks like there's no hope, when it looks like the story's over, the story's not over. Years ago, Tony Campolo put together a sermon, and he does it, he's a, he's a white professor, but he does it like a, a southern preacher who is from a, a, an African-American church, and, and he has this line. He tells the story of Jesus, and tells the disciples, and the, the agony of the Garden of Gethsemane, and he talks about the crucifixion, and every time he told part of the story, he said, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And then he talked about the garden and it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And then he talked about the crucifixion and he said, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. That everything that we go through that's dark and difficult is laying a foundation for God to show his goodness and his grace. And the darkness of the crucifixion pointed to the power of the resurrection. And I don't know where you are in your story. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if you've had a tendency to collect and gather all the losses of this last couple of years. But I want you to know, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. God is working. God can make beauty out of the ugliest ashes there are. And I want to encourage you to lift up your head and to begin to look at God and respond to him and to begin to see yourself and your circumstances in the future in light of God's promises in person instead of your experiences. I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors as you close this up and give us a last thought. Thanks. I don't know where this has hit you, but I want just to, you to listen to yourself. 
Do you tend to rehearse your story with a focus on the losses you have experienced and the difficulties and the pain and the downside? Or do you tend to look back at your history and see how God has done some wonderful things out of it? I think it's a, it's a learned understanding of how to see the world. And even in the reality of difficulties and loss that all of us face, we can begin to see with eyes of faith that God's going to do something with that. That God's going to take that pain for me and he builds my compassion. He builds my empathy. He builds my skill in helping other people. There, there are many, many lessons Many beautiful gifts that can't be gained without some pain. And so I want you just to think in your own life, when you're telling the stories of your last couple years or the rest of your life, do you focus on the difficulties? Do you tend to be complaining and whining and, and looking for sympathy? Or do you tell the story with the, but look what God did out of that. And I don't mean being a Pollyanna and ignoring the things that are painful. What I mean is to begin to say, God, help me to see my life through your eyes instead of to see you through my experiences. Let me pray for us. Father, I know that there are people listening who have lost loved ones, who've lost jobs, who've lost hope, who've lost many, many things. And in the middle of that loss, we can either process it healthily, we can come to you, we can find healing and comfort and cleansing from the, the painful wounds that we've received. Or we can dissolve into a spiral of bitterness like Naomi did. And so I just pray by your Holy Spirit you would speak to each one of us right now. And that you would give us hope that you are at work and that you're going to do wonderful things even if right now we can't see it. And that by faith we would trust you. And by faith we would see you for who you are. And as we read the Bible stories we would see how you're so honest about what people experienced. And yet the beauty of what you can do, even in the middle of the painful things. God, thank you that you've walked with us. Thank you that you've taught us some things about, about church, about life, about who we can trust, about really who are disciples of Christ and who were just coming for the show. Thank you, Father, that you have been at work and we want to see the world like you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you and I love you.